They are better. The nose is straighter. They can breathe better. But it's never perfect. You know, I've done 7,000 rhinoplasties. I've never done a perfect one. Welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh, as we continue our June The American Legends, proudly brought to us by Allegan. I am really excited for this evening's podcast. Um, I met this man way back in 2016 and I visited him numerous times in Dallas and it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have Prof. Rod Rorick on the show tonight. Prof. Rod, welcome to the show. Well, it's my honor to be here with you, Cameron. It's uh, not as good as in person, but it's, it'll have to do for now. But uh, no, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, what a great and innovative idea you have about uh, this podcast. I mean, so, Prof, you know, this, right up yeah, the, the, this podcast goes around the world. And it's actually an opportune time for me to actually publicly say thank you to you. What The influence you've had, not just on my own career, but on Saucer. And you are direct... I still remember standing in the in the OR with you and you saying to me, um, Cameron, you've got to start a society. And we started the society and we had these group of passionate South Africans who came together and it's just been amazing. And from that, we had all these webinars last year, we had the World Rhinoplasty Day. So that little conversation just ignited a fire and uh, it's wonderful that that's, that's something that you've been able to do. And I think one of the things I admire about you is how dedicated you are to education and I still remember once after about two weeks of sitting and listening and watching and being in theater and everything asking you the question the one day I said to you I said prof where do you get the time for all this academics because like we're in the OR from six in the morning till 11 at night and you put the scalpel down you said to me Cameron academia is a state of mind (laughs) it is yeah, so, so can we start off by, um, maybe for the listeners, giving a brief background on how you ended up where you're at now. Where did your medical career start, your interest in plastic surgery, your interest in, in being a journal uh, yeah. editor, etc.? Well, I was, um, you know, I grew up in a ranch in uh, the upper Midwest in a place called North Dakota. And as a German-Russian community, I didn't speak English till I was six, and uh and I just, uh, you know, always had a natural curiosity for um, science, and and that kind of drew me. Uh, certainly, from a community like that that had incredibly great work ethic and background, which is what I think is one of the most important things that my parents gave me because they were farmers and ranchers. And so, when I grew up, I loved science. So then, I, it just got drawn to medicine because I wanted to help others, and then I. I uh, I love that and I love medicine and I went to medical school in Texas in Houston and then um, from that I actually started, I actually wanted to be a cardiac surgeon but I was on Dr. DeBakey's service and then I happened to meet uh, this wonderful plastic surgeon called Mel Spira and he showed me a cleft lip and he did a cleft lip and I scrubbed in with him and and it was over. That was it because you could combine the art and the science together. And that was it. So then I landed in the University of Michigan with Dr. Grab and Dingman, these incredible giants in plastic surgery. And I loved it. I mean, I did general surgery, plastic surgery there. And then I spent uh, time doing craniofacial surgery at Oxford at the Radcliffe Infirmary. And then when I finished in Michigan, I then went to to Harvard to uh, do a micro and hand fellowship because I knew I was going to do academics, Cameron. I, I knew I wanted to do something because I love to teach, I love to give back, and so I came to Dallas in in uh, in, in late eighty in uh, late eighty seven, and then I uh, decided to build a program here, and of course we built one of the best programs in the country, and 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 then I happened to meet Jack Gunter, who was a an incredible rhinoplasty surgeon. He, Cameron, was a senior resident at the University of Michigan. And all of you who know Jack Gunter, he was he was an incredible rhinoplasty surgeon. He was both otolaryngology and plastic surgery. And we became very best of friends. And of course, he started the Dallas rhinoplasty meeting. And I've been honored to, to take over with, uh, with him over the past 25 years. And now, obviously, Jack has passed and I've run it for the past uh, 
over the past five years and always in his honor. And of course, you've been there with me, Cameron. And um, last year was the first time we actually held it live uh, <laughs> online, obviously, because of COVID. But, you know, I think um, plastic surgery and rhinoplasty is similar because it's a passion. And, mm. you know, I don't, I've never been to work a day in my life. I've always loved what I do. So that's the passion that I want to share with you all that if you love something, you will you will never have to work a day in your life. I mean, I'm up at 4.35 in the morning. I'm reading. I'm, I'm doing my exercises, and I'm doing all the journal work. I'm also editor of the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. And then, you know, I go to work at 6, 6.30, and I meet with my fellows and residents, and then I do surgery almost. I operate every day of the week. And it's all about, you know, loving what you do, having passion, and and being and being uh, uh, skilled in learning from your your mistakes as you go by, as you go, especially in rhinoplasty. You know, rhinoplasty is a surgery of millimeters, and so it is very unforgiving. It's the most unforgiving operation in all of plastic surgery. You know, there is a difference between one millimeter between a great result and a and a failure, and so that's why I love it, and that's why it's it's a passion, and and it's an evolution, and so I would just tell people that are wanting to become a rhinoplasty surgeon, want to become a rhinoplasty expert. It's a journey, it's not a sprint, you know, it's a marathon. And I think that's the most important thing. You know, stay focused, learn a lot, give back, always, always um, do better. And I think that's one of the most important things you can do is, you know, just learn to, learn to be better. Just, I've been through the evolution of so many fads in plastic surgery and, um, and especially in rhinoplasty. In rhinoplasty, it is not forgiving. So if you have a fad or do things that don't work, uh, they come back to haunt you at one, two, five years. And and I see those patients. You know, now I see patients that are 10, 15 years out, and I say, wow, I did a component dorsal reduction, and I probably should have done a spreader flap, not a tension spanning suture because it's too narrow. Mm. Or, you know, that's what, I, that's what I've learned recently in the past seven, five to seven years of not using a Kali Muller strut as much because I found that the Kali Muller strut would drop my tips, especially in males, thick skin patients, mm -hmm. secondaries. Mm -hmm. So I started using a, a fixed mobile septal extension graft to hold it in place because you want to do something that will, will stand the test of time and mm -hmm. last a lifetime. And I think that's the most important thing that people need to learn. And so... I'm very, very, um, uh, you know, since I teach every day and I want to make sure that when I teach somebody that they can go home and do it versus, you know, a fad where you can just say, oh, you know, we love just doing this thing mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. stuffing a graft in here or something. And so I, I think it's so important for us to teach people to do it the right way. Uh, and, I, and I'll give you a classic example today of... Uh, you know, preservation versus precision rhinoplasty. I mean, I think both have a have an um, will, will have a role, but I think that one should not think one over the other. But I do b firmly believe that I think before you do precision, uh, before you do preservation rhino, which I think may be a misnomer, uh, you should learn precision rhinoplasty or structural rhinoplasty mm -hmm. because there are so many things that you need to do and learn to do before you go and attempt doing a sept, a you know, taking apart the septum, which to me is the hallmark of a nose because as you know, Cameron, you know, a nose has to look good, but it also has to function. Mm -hmm. And if you destroy function, uh, then it's a failure. And I see so many patients every week that have that problem and they may look good, but they can't breathe or they have rhinorrhea mm -hmm. or somebody took their turbinates out. These are all things that really we have to teach, we have to teach the basics. And I think that's, to me, a, a hallmark of, of a master is that you have to learn, you have to take something that's very complicated and make it simple to teach. And that's really what I do every day. And, you know, you were with me, uh, you know, several years ago. And, and you know, I, I do that every day. And things change. I mean, mm -hmm. change is constant. And if you have to embrace change, and if you don't embrace change, you'll never go anywhere. And you're going to be back, you know, and doing things. I, as I always tell my fellows and residents when they come back to visit me and haven't seen me for five years, they say, oh my God, Dr. Rick, you're no longer doing this or that. And I'm going, yeah, because things change. And also you learn things. And like the like the, like the the Kaimana strut, I mean, I, I don't use it as much. I mean, I used to use it in 80% of my patients. Now I use it in about 3%. So because I watch my patients and I say, gee, I have inadequate tip projection. Or I 
I now no longer have to use a tip graft in a primary rhinoplasty because I know I, I, I don't need a tip graft mm. because my Kalyamala strut, uh, with my Kalyamala strut, I needed that extra to get the tip refinement. I can do it now with tip shaping and all those things, you know, that we've learned from each other. And I think mm. the other thing is we have to learn from each other. Mm. You know, the great things that Rick Davis has taught us about tensioning the lower laterals, I mean, amazing stuff. And what uh, Dean Toriumi's talked to us about tip shaping, um, and, and I think I've learned a lot. I think preservation rhinoplasty has a lot of attributes. I mean, I, you know, I incorporate every day in pres preservation things into my structural precision rhinoplasty, you know, mm. the tip. I preserve or restore the ligaments, I, I do that. But, you know, on the dorsum, I have to be very careful because, you know, I think if you master the dorsum, and getting the dorsal static lines correct with, with grafts, flaps, or sutures, um, you know, I think the end always justifies what you do, Cameron. Mm. And I think mm. that it's like we were talking before, you know, if you're getting great results, uh, we have this old Texas saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, rhinoplasty is hard enough without making major changes. So. The only time I make major changes is when I see inconsistency in my long-term results, like I did with Caillou Miller struts. I mean, I used them for over 15 years, hmm. and then when I did a study and looked at them and said, oh my goodness, I'm not getting tip projection. I'm maintaining tip projection hmm. at best. So I changed it, and that's evidence-based. And I think hmm. we need to now go from you know, expert-based to evidence-based medicine in rhinoplasty. And that's been a very painful journey. Hmm. I mean, I can tell you, um, even the use of fillers, for example, a lot of us, you know, they're, in rhinoplasty, about half of the experts say don't use them, and the other half say it's a not good adjunct. All these things are adjuncts. I mean, I use uh, fillers every day, but I use some that are safe. I teach people to do it well. I use hyaluronic acid based fillers. But you can't say I'm not going to do it because guess what? Who's doing it are the people that shouldn't be doing it. You know, people that aren't, that don't know the anatomy. We as as facial plastic surgeons, as otolaryngologists, as plastic surgeons, we know the nose. And if we're letting other people do it, that's a disaster. So I know that's kind of long-winded intro, Cameron, but I just kind of want to just set the stage for no, it's, what, it's, I think is, what does it take to be consistent and to be excellent? And it's two things. You know, you know you've got to you know, to be the best, you have to learn from the best. And I learned from the best. I learned from Jack Gunter, Jack Sheen, and all of these incredible leaders, Bob and Gairon and Dean, all these great people. And then you have to learn from your failures. And those two things are, are compounded and they really are not mutually exclusive, but they are in unison to make you better. And every day you have to say, I am not gonna leave the operating room until it looks as great as it can look. And I, that's the one promise, you know, people always say, oh, I want this image, you know, I want this. And I said, you know, I'm not God, but I will give you the best that you can have in the operating room. And I think the difference between what we do as rhinoplasty experts and Michelangelo is that Michelangelo, when he was done with David, it was good because it was rock. It was, it was solid. <laughs> it was marble and it was going to be done. But we operate in human flesh, you know, that's the most different, difficult form of art form. And so... So that's what we have to tell our patients. And, and rhinoplasty, of course, epitomizes that. So. Okay, so I have a question for you. In, in terms of the approach to rhinoplasty, when there are some red lights flashing, but here you are at the start of your career, you, any nose that's going to wants an operation is going to get an operation. What are some of your thoughts or comments in terms of being careful who not to operate on? Because once you've done the operation, the power is in the patient's hands. Right. Right, the moment you drop the scalpel on that nose, it's your patient. It's kind of tag you're it. So I will tell you, uh, and that's a great question, Cam. The most important thing is, you know, there's several things. I don't operate on people that I don't like. I don't operate on people that smoke. I don't operate on people that I don't think are realistic or that badmouth previous surgeons or, or, uh, or anybody. Uh, I think that's a very bad sign. And, uh, and I think the other thing is that they have to be healthy, of course, mm -hmm. and they have to be realistic. Now, how, people always say, well, how do you determine that? Well, you know, I think that computer imaging to me has been a, a, an epic. It's been an epiphany because 
I do computer imaging, and it doesn't matter. You know, you, you can buy all these expensive computer imaging. It doesn't matter. You can do Photoshop. Heck, today you could do it online and get a simple app. The most important thing is that you show them an image that's somewhat better, but never show them a perfect image mm. because remember, it's called imprinting. And imprinting means that, oh my God, that's what it's going to say. That's what I think I'm going to get. Well, first of all, I always tell them, I am not God. I'm not Merlin. I'm not a magician. But it will be better. And, and you, this is a representation. And I, and we have this caption, at least in America, we have to have these captions. These are educational views only, not a guarantee of results. And because of our legal system. And they truly aren't. They're just educational views. And I've done it for over almost 20 years. I've never had a patient that said to me, oh, my God, you didn't guarantee results. Because they know it's just an image. And usually I totally underdo it. I give them maybe a 70, 80 percent result. And if they're happy with that, Cameron, I... I, that's a very positive mm -hmm. sign, especially mm -hmm. for the secondary. But mm -hmm. if they come back and send me four emails with five different images and all of it, I don't operate on them because they're never going to be happy. Just remember, you know, if they aren't, if they weren't happy before and talked badly about their previous surgeon, you're next on the list. Yes. So I I rarely operate on those people because I mean I had a patient in my office that had you know operations by you know two previous excellent rhinoplasty surgeons in North America. And I'm not going to touch her because, first of all, she had a really good result. She had some problem I could easily fix, but I'm not going to touch her because she was saying awful things about mm -hmm. her previous surgeons that are superb rhinoplasty mm -hmm. surgeons. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we all have patients uh, that need revisions. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, if you haven't had a revision, you haven't done enough rhinoplasty. So, so yeah. we all live in glass houses. So we have to be very careful about that. And. Um, and I think that that's that's the lesson that you should you should take and don't operate on everybody that you see. That's a yes. disaster. And I know okay. you're starting and you have to pay your bills and okay, you know, so you got to be careful. So my question is, I mean, how does Rod Rorick say I'm not going to operate on you? Okay, there's a few things that I tell them, and I, I and I, I tell them because in this age of Google reviews and everything, and it's true, is that sometimes I just tell them and these are the following words that I use because. You know, I just tell them, I'm not good enough to give you the result that you want. Mm. And that's really true because mm. if they want something that's not possible, I, I can't do that. I mean, I, I'm here, you know, first of all, you can't, you know, I'm not in the business of happiness. Mm. You know, happiness is an ethereal thing that mm. we all, mm. you know, aspire mm. to. But I'm in, the, I'm in the business of making people's nose look better and function well. Mm. And happiness is part of your your you know uh, makeup. Your, your it's what who and what you are. So, I mean, I, I have to be able to say, I'm going to give you the best to my ability, the best mm. nose that mm. look good on you. And if that isn't what they want, then I can't do that. So then I tell them I just can't do that. Like uh, I had a patient that wanted so much of a slope on her nose that I said I can't I can't do that because. Mm. My aesthetic endpoint is not giving you a ski slope and a real overprojected tip. You know that you. I mean, I can send them to a country or something where they can get that, but I am not going to do that because I don't want my name yeah. on that. And plus, also that looks terrible. Yeah. So I don't do that, and I and, and I tell them that, and they'll they'll sometimes. And you know, the crazy thing is, they may get it, and then about two years later they'll come back, and then I have to do a rib graft or something. But yeah. <laughs> Never do something that's not aesthetically good. For, uh, that you don't. If you don't know, if you don't agree with the aesthetic endpoint, when do you stop? Exactly. Okay. So another question for you, because the, you you're one of the key opinion leaders in terms of social media, should I say, and adding value on social media. I mean, I love this unbotched series that you've been running on on Instagram, yeah. etc. So, what are some of your comments around social media? Because I think there's a concern that people are putting unrealistic results out there right um i'd love to hear what you think about all of this well i i, I agree cameron i think i think the, the reason i started doing social media was actually because of the journal we wanted to promote you know our the plastic surgery real peer-reviewed our journal articles from the journal of plastic and reconstructive surgery and from a global open our access open access journal and then I, I realized the power of social media, especially today, it happens to be Instagram. You know, Facebook is still the big kahuna, but of course, Facebook owns Instagram and a lot of other, they own that and they own WhatsApp and all these other things. So I think social media is very important, but please, yeah, recognize that many views, especially if they're static and not video, can be altered. 
And there's a study to show that 50 to 70 percent of views that are static are, are altered, which is very unbelievable. So I try and do videos, and I do patients with early post-op and long post-op. Obviously, during COVID, we've had a little problem getting longer-term post-ops because, you know, sometimes they'll send you photos and you see a lot of that. But you know, I try not to show people that, that are on the beach to show me their rhinoplasty. I mean, that, that's not very savvy, but. But I think it's important that we are honest and ethical, and, mm -hmm. and so I, mm -hmm. I show a lot. Today, you know, today I posted somebody that had a rhinoplasty and that had a buccal fat removal, and you know it was intraop, and it's a story. But if you post a post, you can show that patient seven to you know days, two months, six months out, and people get a feeling of that the swelling gets down less, and it's not a perfect result. That's a good thing, Cameron. I, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect result. Yeah. Uh, but they look better. They are better. The nose is straighter. They can breathe better. But it's never perfect. You know, I've done 7,000 rhinoplasties. I've never done a perfect one, but I'm, I'm always trying to make it as good as I can make it intraoperatively. And I think that's the pledge and honest. You know, I think people, normal people appre uh, really appreciate if you're honest. And, and the other thing, Cameron, is when I see a patient back, I always tell them, uh, you know, if at 12 or 15 months for a primary rhinoplasty, if, if I or her do not see something that I like, I'll tell them and I'll fix it. Mm. You know, I'll just do it. Mm. You know, it's a small percentage of patients, but it's not a problem. In secondaries, it's, you know, it usually takes two years. And, and of course, that's a little bit more challenging because in secondary patients, many times they look incredibly different, but they now want to look Perfect, and that's a problem because yeah. I saw a patient that was two and a half years out of, from rhinoplasty that she came to, back to see me from New York, and she's amazing. And I mean, there was just a small little nasal tip asymmetry, and I said, you know, let's look. And then you, we showed her previous photo, and it was like a total metamorphosis. Yeah. And she said, oh, okay, I got it. I, I and, you know, because you have to bring him back to earth. Yes, and um, and I think that's also where fillers sometimes come in because sometimes if they have a small little irregularity of two three years, because the last thing you want to do is go in back in on a patient that's had four rhinoplasties. Mm. You know, I tell them you only are, you know God will only let you have so many rhinoplasties on your nose, and um, so you have to be honest with them. And most people that are rational will agree with that. And you know, and if, and if they're not, then of course you've not chosen well. And we've all done that, but. Mm. Uh, the key mm. is to not do no harm and to be the best you can be. And if you do that, then, you know, I think a high majority of patients will be very satisfied because, mm. I, you know, the other thing about the global uh, Internet and all of the, you know, the consults that we see from around the world every week is that, you know, in one way it's good, but it also shows you where and what parts of the world are people are doing different types of rhinoplasty. Mm. And, um and our goal is to help them, and obviously, um, you know that that's important. And also, we have meetings, global meetings, that actually will help people become better rhinoplasty surgeons too. So, Prof, my, my last question for you is: you must have quite a unique view of where the world is going in terms of facial plastic surgery, plastic surgery, rhinoplasty. Being the editor of the PRS Journal, where do you foresee the future of us going within? maybe this small little rhinoplasty world? Well, I mean, I think that we'll continue to refine and define rhinoplasty. And I think, you know, I, what I love is, I love the incredible partnership that uh, both facial plastic surgeons and, fa and plastic surgeons have today. I really think that's phenomenal. Um, you know, obviously I learned rhinoplasty from Jack Gunter, who was both a fa facial plastic surgeon and a plastic surgeon. So, I mean, I've, I've always embraced that because, you know, that's we're surgeons and that's what we do. And I think that's wonderful. I think that the, um, the, the coming together of those two specialties has been, has been victorious for rhinoplasty. And we're seeing that with preservation. And I predict with preservation that, you know, we have to get through this zealot phase. There's always these phases of any type of technology. There's a zealot phase where everybody thinks it should be done for everything. And then once we see the results and we see the data, then it kind of gets into this area. Mm. So we need to just take a deep breath and say, oh, my God, you know, um, it's like fillers. Fillers were the same. You know, you, you, fillers, you know they used to say fillers are going to replace rhinoplasty. Well, we know that's not true, but it's a good adjunct. 
you know, and in fact, fillers are fine. You know, it's temporary. It makes your nose bigger. And, and preservation rhinoplasty principles, I think, are very important for the tip and, and I think for the dorsum and selected patients have a straight nose, but have a dorsal hump. But, but I think one of the things I would plea is that please become uh, an expert at structural precision rhinoplasty or really understand it because if you take apart a nose in preservation rhinoplasty, which is kind of a misnomer where you're taking a low septum and you're splitting it and you're going to go through the L strut and then with osteotomies basically take down the nose to push down, um, you've got to be very careful and you've got to know rhinoplasty to get out of that trouble. I've seen two patients now that have a saddle deformity from experts. So you have to be very, very mm -hmm. uh, knowledgeable of your anatomy before you kind of rush to uh, judgment here. And, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, time will tell. I just say, take, everybody needs to take a deep breath. I, I briefly spoke and, with uh, Prof. Peter Adamson today, and he, he was telling me that 30 years ago, he was in Paris and, and Yves Saban was showing him, then he was doing push down, let down preservation. I mean, so this is a man who's been in the game for 30 years doing it. He's a maxillofacial surgeon trained. So for us just to start Dr. thinking, oh, I'm just going to start doing Yeah, you know, you've got to be careful. You mean Dr. Saban, you mean? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. And he's phenomenal. In fact, at our Dallas rhinoplasty meeting, it, it was such a pleasure having him. We had him on all the panels. And I think he's probably done more preservation than anybody in the world. I think. I mean, yeah. he's published about it, you know, two, three decades ago. And uh, I respect, it was so interesting on, all of our, on many of our panels, he would say, Cameron, well, I don't know if I would do a preservation rhinoplasty in that patient. Yeah. This is the guy that's done more than anybody. Yeah. So we have to, yeah. we have to respect that. And yeah. um, so, I, you know, I think it's going to be great. I think, you know, we need to hold Congresses. We need to, that's why it's going to be so great, uh, you know, at your meeting, but also at our upcoming Dallas Rhino meeting next year, we're going to have, we're going to have people live the preservation, there's the precision ones, and hopefully you can join us. We'll have, we're gonna go to the cadaver lab and we're gonna show everybody what, what works and what doesn't work. And I think that's the hands-on things that we need to do to push rhinoplasty mm. forward. Because I think out of all of these things, they're gonna get the hybrid, and we're already talking about the hybrid part, mm. you know, but I think the biggest thing is we have to take that and make it simple and safe. Because yes. if you don't make it simpler and safe and reproducible, then then it's going to be a problem. And we've seen what happens when you don't make it um, more easy, to, or easier to do and safe. So. That's awesome. Okay, last thing. So I know th with the, the Dallas rhinoplasty being course being online, which is great. I, I've got lots of rhinoplasty textbooks, but I would probably say my go-to textbooks are the primary and the revision Dallas Rhinoplasty yep. course books. How do the listeners get hold of those books? Well, uh, you can purchase the Dallas Rhinoplasty book and the, and the secondary Rhinoplasty book, both from Thema uh, online. It's, it's, a, it's a book company that's actually based in Germany. And it publishes all my books, including the recent one on facial danger zones and a new one that's coming up that's going to have all the videos on how to do cosmetic surgery, you know, five-minute videos. And, and uh, I think uh, it's great. And if you have any questions, obviously they can email me at rod rod.rorick at um, dpsi.com. But uh, um, or I'm sorry, it's rod.rorick at dpsi.org for my email. But but I think the um, you know the most important thing is you know just learn you know learn to be the best you can be every day, and don't be afraid to ask for ask questions. I mean I, I mean I talk to colleagues every day hmm. either by FaceTime or. Uh, email or text or and then now with you know DMing on Instagram uh, because you know I get a lot of messages saying hey I, I, I know how to do you know the septal extension graft or something so but you know we're all here to help each other and and Cameron I want to congratulate you for all you've been doing you're really becoming a superb educator in, in uh, rhinoplasty I'm proud of you and, and I think I can't wait to come visit and see your new OR that you told me about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Prof, thank you so much. And to all our listeners, thank you very much. Um, thank you to them. And Prof, thank you so much for taking time off on a busy event on a Sunday. I'm sure you're busy. I, I really appreciate it. And, and um, on behalf of all the listeners from around the world, thank you very much. And good luck with everything you're doing. And carry on teaching us, please. Thank you, Cameron. Great day.
Thanks. So that wraps up this meeting. Thanks very much to Elegan. And we look forward to hearing more interesting stories next week on the Rhinoplasty podcast. <laughs>